In 1981, Americans popped in between five and nine billion dollars worth of quarters and tokens into the slots of arcade video games. It's the video game years, and this is 1981. The systems, the culture, the games. A sequel to a shooter makes waves. When they link together, it's a friggin' paradox. Atari battles it out with Mattel. You didn't usually, in a commercial, say who your competitor was. And Nintendo's pet gorilla gets angry. Then the barrel's just gonna travel, it's gonna drop down, it's gonna come over, it's gonna kill you. Plus, Lord British returns, and Pac-Man gets a girlfriend. So pop in those tabletop batteries and look both ways before crossing the road. This is 1981. Frankly, I'm swamped by admirers, so to get away from it all, I reach for Frogger. It's a challenge. Frogger is awesome because of roadkill, and roadkill is hilarious. Do you really need to know anything else? <laughs> I don't. Frogger is another classic arcade game. It came out in 1981. It was developed by Konami, and it came to the States through Sega Gremlin, uh, their partnership. And the, the gameplay is classic. It's very simple. Get to the other side, and... Try to get around everybody. If you're a frog, you have to get from one side of the street or a river or what have you to the other. Whenever you're in a crowded environment, everybody thinks of Frogger, right? And he's hopping through f***ing traffic and it's like your car's coming, you're like, oh no, you f***ing just hop this way and boom, till you find a clearing, then you go up and then you get to the middle and you're like, you're like safe, but it's like, oh wait a minute, I'm not totally safe, I can't just stay there. Well, uh, like jumping on logs so you don't fall in the water, you're a frog, but you can't fall in the water. Yeah. Your frog. That's why Frogger is so appealing because it's so um, it's so simple. But when the patterns really start going in the later levels, the different speeds for the logs and the turtles, the turtles that dunk, the alligators can't step on the heads, oh. only the tails. You just like jump and then you die, and it's like, oh, I thought that was a log, but no, that was water. But it's different than the other water. And so you got to like like really be be selective in your moves and 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 what's what I'm looking for here, uh, strategic. One of the things that people don't know about Frogger is that when you complete the level in Frogger, people never look at the Frogger's face. And and he's a frog, dressed up very dapper like. Yeah, he's got a tie. He's got a suitcase. Can you even see that in the game, or is it just in the arcade? It's just in the arcade side art. I always found that weird too. So all the frogs, when you complete the frogs, look next time and you'll see these hearts pop up. It's crazy, no one ever, no one ever realized that. And then there was like the, the pink girl frogs that hop on your back. Should not be the other way around? Ooh yeah, watch oh. me sweat. Oh. I never knew when I was young, but now, 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 it all now I understand, now I understand. There's massive sexual overtones in Frogger. Ah, push it. I love Frogger for the simple, fun gameplay and the simple little tunes that you hear throughout the game, like um, Camp Town Races, Yankee Doodle, and not just American ditties either. It's you're gonna hear some Japanese jingles. It was made by Konami of Japan, so the opening track that we all know and love is actually Inu no Omowari san, which is Japanese for dog policeman. <laughs> Arigato. It's an incredibly fun game that manages to be fun by not changing the visuals very often, but by changing the variables uh, in play. And that keeps it fresh and interesting. In subsequent years, a lot of clones were done in that style of hopping across a freeway and avoiding getting smushed by something. Frogger inevitably got its clone uh, by Activision, actually. Wow. Yeah, in called the Freeway. In the form of Freeway. Yeah. So freeway, you play as a chicken. He has to cross the road. And why does he have to cross the road? Because you can't move left or right to walk down the sidewalk. It's like someone looked at Frogger and said, we gotta do that, but take away fun. People who were there back in the day, people who were teenagers back in the day, still fondly remember and look back on 
And the, the number one exhibit for that is that Frogger was featured in an episode of Seinfeld. I love that in order to maintain his high score at the local pizzeria, didn't, did, he had to have a, a power generator created so that yeah, he could something. transfer the Frogger yeah. machine to his apartment but still maintain his high score. Yes. Want to hear a joke? Why did the Frogger cross the road? It didn't. Okay, Frank. Ladybug by Universal. Basically a Pac-Man ripoff clone. Collect dots and you get uh, you get letters to spell special and extra. And normally I don't like clones of other games, but this was a good one. They did introduce something kind of new to the whole thing, that is altering the maze. Now that's how you make a clone of a game. You innovate on it. And that's exactly what Ladybug did. As you avoid your little insect enemies trying to eat your Ladybug, there's little green trap do doors that you can use to trap them and get away from them. So just that little spin itself makes it one of the more unique uh, maze games that came out in the early 80s. I also like that when you die, you turn into a pair of wings and a halo as you float to heaven. I guess ladybugs aren't so lucky after all. It was not received very well, you know, in the arcades. However, when it was ported to the ColecoVision, it did experience some moderate success. I like Ladybug. I think it's unique. I think it's cute. It's fun. Yay, Ladybug! Woo! Game over. The Entex Select a Game certainly existed. Entex, which is a company that nobody knows about, released the Entex Select a Game. It was very notable for being the first portable system, uh, gaming system, with uh, you know, interchangeable cartridges. And that's what anybody remembers it for. And by anybody, I mean maybe one in a hundred thousand people. It came with Space Invaders 2, which was cool. Um, and one of the games they uh, had produced for it was Pac-Man 2, and so Coleco sued the hell out of them because Coleco owned the rights to the handheld version of Pac-Man at the time. It had interchangeable games, and it preceded Entex's Adventure Vision, which came out the following year, so it didn't have a long life. Only wackos own this. So here's Pac-Man 2, which was on the Entex Selected game, but they also released it as a standalone, and it's the same game, and it's actually two players. It's the APF MP1000 of, uh, of 1981. The Entex Selected game was important because it sort of paved the way for other handheld, uh, handheld consoles where you swapped out the games, and we followed up by the Adventure Vision in 82, but, but you're gonna have to wait for that exciting story. Wonder what my cat's doing right now. Insert coin. Galaga! Galaga was the sequel to the 1979 shooter Galaxian. Galaxian was very big when it came out. It, it had a lot of firsts, all right? But Galaga, its sequel, some people will claim a superior game, is just the far superior game. This was the prime example of how to do a sequel right. For one thing, it didn't have that Space Invader one bullet at a time style, and it also had a challenging stage where the player got to shoot enemies as they literally waltzed across the screen. It was a pretty good graphical improvement over the first one too. It actually was. Look at the little space butterflies. What are they doing up there? You, there's no air to push, so what do they get? They're just flopping around in space and then they just go. Galaga is a lot like the Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo of, of shooters back then. They took it, and Galaxian was a fairly slow game, and Galaga actually speeds it up. Galaxian, you could only go pew. Galaga, you could go pew, pew, pew. That was the one where they moved. Okay, it wasn't the, that was Space Invaders. In Space Invaders and Galaxian and all those other clones of Space Invaders, the enemies were always, as soon as you start stage, preset. They were there, one pattern, that's it. Galaga mixed that up with having them actually come in the screen and set up their formations. That was the first game with a familiar, wasn't it? A double ship. Probably the coolest feature in Galaga is the ability to use dual ships, or dualies as I like to call it. Which is a scam. Now in the game, you can allow your ship to be taken up by one of the enemies in the tractor beam, and if you shoot that guy, the ship falls and you get a double whammy, you get two side-by-side -side space shooters. 
and then you just wreak holy destruction upon your enemy from now until the cows come home, or aliens come home. It's awesome, but as a kid, I was thinking, what's going on here, you know? Assuming this is like Pac-Man, you know, your character dies and you have an extra life, your character is more or less resurrected. It's a scam because it's easier to get killed and you lose that life like a normal Galaga deck. I don't like it, never did it. So what's going on in Galaga? I mean, if your ship just got captured, but then you've got a life left and your character pops up at the bottom of the screen, who's that and who am I? And then when they link together, it's a friggin' paradox. Galaga's been released on just about every single platform. Yeah. Uh, and this is another game that was distributed by Midway in America. So yet again, I mean, you had that and Ms. Pac-Man. You had a great one-two punch. Midway had a great year in 81, all right? Um, but it was a Namco game, and to this day, it still is a Namco game. And it's on every single collection they put out. They got new, new Galagas coming out. They got new Pac-Mans. They've made so many incarnations and sequels to that game. Okay, the Pac-Mans are pretty good. Galaga, I remember Galaga 90 for the Turbo Graphics, which seemed odd. Yeah. I think it was Galaga 89 in Japan. They really yeah. Galaga 90 was leaps and bounds better. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 90s, yo! Galaga, man, it's just one of those machines that whenever I see it, I have to play it, and I have to, you know, get in the zone and just score all those points and fail miserably at around stage 12. Galaga just blends in for me with all the other shooters. I don't know, it just is like, there's so much space it was a space age of gaming. I, I guess it's influential, they're all influential. Because I shot my own ship, because I'm terrible, and then my whole day is ruined, and what the frick do I play this game for? Uh, yeah, that's Galaga, I love it. It influenced me to walk past the Galaga machine to something else that I'd rather play. <laughs> oh, I got so sick of those shooters. And now, here is the gaming innovation of 1981. Ah. Welcome to the Gaming Innovation of 1981. What new technology graced the world and changed the face of gaming forever? The Intellivision Play Cable, generally regarded as the first way for people to download video games from the comfort of their own home. It worked by broadcasting video game code on a loop via cable. People could select what game they wanted via the Play Cable and then download it onto their own system. Unfortunately, by 1983, Intellivision games had generally gotten so big 8K of memory and up, that there was no space on the play cable to actually download these newer games, and the service was discontinued. But a very similar technology was used by Sega to create the Sega Channel later in the 90s. That's the video game innovation of 1981. I'll see you next year, and don't forget, it's not just nostalgia, it's science. It's time for what should have been a video game in 1981. Oh, hello. I'm Eric, and here's the stuff from 1981 that should have been turned into a video game. From the sitcom Different Strokes, a maze game that would later be the inspiration for an episode that would air in 1983. The point of the game would be for your character to crack wise while running around the maze trying to avoid being eaten by the pedophile bike shop owner. Try not to think too much about the video game's title. What you talking about, pedo? From the movie Tarzan the Ape Man, a platformer where your character would swing from vines... Wait. A game like that did come out the next year. From Nickelodeon's variety show, you can't do that on television. For the Intellivision. Finally, your 12-digit keypad will come in handy as you play locker jokes. Pop out of the lockers in time to say the punchline, but watch your timing. Pop out too late, and you get slimed. Pop out too early, you decapitate your friends. And that's what should have been a video game in 1981. I want to play them. Power up. With options like the new IBM printers and the IBM PC network, IBM personal computers, see them at a store near you or call your IBM representative. So IBM was a huge mainframe company, especially prominent throughout the 60s and into the 70s and even in the 80s. But, of course, you had companies like Apple and TRS, uh, Tandy Radio Shack, making their computers that were getting really popular in not only homes, but the small business sector. And, of course, IBM was like, holy crap, we need to do this. The IBM PC came out in 1981, model 5150. So this was not only IBM's first 
personal computer. It was also the first computer to be called a PC, as we know the term today. People equated personal computer for the next two decades with IBM compatible computers. Opened up gaming to a lot more people later on. The PC initially was mostly used for business applications and was actually incredibly poor for handling games. So while the IBM PC was meant as a business computer, it really didn't have a lot of business software to begin with. It didn't have much of anything. Mavis Beacon, she broke down those racial barriers in the 80s through her great typing software. The IBM uh, PCs had this beautiful keyboard that was spring-loaded. Oh. Oh, it's a beautiful mechanism where you uh, hit it, ka-ching! For a while, Apple still had the leg up on business computing. That is until Lotus 123 came along for the PC. Mm. Ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. You felt like you were getting work done. As easy as one, two, three, and opening it up and uh, looking inside. It's pretty easy. So you get into the early 80s, and all of a sudden you got these cheap little, like, you know, pirates of games coming up. You know, you copy them on a five and a quarter, give them to give them to your neighbor, your co-worker. You would trade them and open up gaming to a lot more people. My first video game was Microsoft Flight Simulator for this old IBM compatible uh, Epson. That's how I discovered gaming was on my 8086 XT, you know? Yeah, the printer company. They made computers back then. What? CGA, you only need four colors. You only need an ugly red, ugly, ugly yellow, ugly blue. <laughs> all you blue, need is magenta, ugly cyan. Green. That's all you need. I don't know why I don't have one of those uh, keyboards. That, that's, just, that's just good fun right there. That would give me minutes of entertainment to have. All of a sudden, the PC shows up and changes the way computing works from here on out. And yeah, that's continued on to today. And in fact, there's a lot of compatibility in between the old systems and the new ones. Yeah, and it's the most dominant uh, platform today. A modern PC is still gonna be able to run a lot of the same software if you tweak it enough. It starts changing when you get into the 64-bit stuff, but we're not talking about that. <laughs> Do you have ice hockey by Activision? I think you're ready for it. <laughs> One of the roughest video games around for your Atari game system. Ready to battle for the puck? Well. To inflict fierce body checking? Yeah. Furious stick checking? Yeah. Ruthless tripping! Yeah. You really think you're ready for all that? I'm ready! I'm ready! Fine. Cash your charge. Ice hockey by Activision! <laughs> Point. Okay, so one of the television releases in 81 was Snafu, which is essentially a big problem. Very grating soundtrack, but, uh, but ingrained completely in my memory uh, till the end of time. It's a Snafu! It's really a snake game where you gotta block the other snakes. Picture Tron, light cycle game, and you got Snafu, but it was multiple players, so it was fun for the entire television family. When Mattel got a hold of it, they wanted to call it Snafu, after the military acronym Snafu, of course, standing for snakes never approach funky underwear. You have your snakes, and they're traveling around, and you know, their tail never stops, you know, it, it, it's just there forever, it's like a wall. And you have to kind of maneuver and whichever one of you goes kaboom and crashes into something first, loses. But taking something like that and putting it, uh, you know, on a console was kind of genius. You know, now everyone can play. Let's just give them more games with better graphics. And so they just kept talking about the graphics and all the ads, hey, the better graphics systems here, this is great. You could not deny that the Intellivision with, you know, a couple of years of extra development time on the on the 2600 had much, much, much better graphics. You know, Intellivision's a big competitor. It's starting to get more attention. But again, they don't have the arcade licenses, so they're making their own stuff. One of those would be Astro Smash, which was sort of their answer to a uh, Space Invaders Galaga type game that they wanted on the system. Astro Smash was a very popular game for the Intellivision, so much so that it went on to replace Las Vegas Poker and Blackjack as the pack-in game. It was basically a cross between Space Invaders and Asteroids. 
The interesting thing about Asteroid Smash, though, is for every asteroid that you let go past, you actually lose part of your score. So if you play the game safe, you don't gain any points. Asteroid Smash is one of those games that anyone can pick up and play. It doesn't take a lot of, you know, neurons firing to know how to play this game. Was it a smash in good time, you? Oh, Jesus Christ. Press start. The Defender sees lots of alien ships. The Defender sees lots of radar blips. Every blip is a ship. Watch this, I got this guy. <laughs> On a body snatching trip. What really stood out in my mind about Defender is the arcade cabinet. It is the boxiest arcade cabinet I think I've ever seen. It's like the, the coin box, lower part is a box, the monitor is a straight box, no curves to this machine whatsoever. I like curves in my arcade cabinet just because it's something to hold on to. <laughs> Eugene Jarvis, who created Defender, uh, was actually a pinball programmer for a very long time, and he continued to be after making Defender. He left Atari's pinball division, and he went to Williams. Um, at Williams, he decided he wanted to try his hand at making a game. So he and Steve Ritchie, another famous pinball designer, started knocking around ideas of what would be cool, and they thought, well, hey, let's kind of take this Space Invaders concept but turn it on its side. Defender had some really interesting things going for it, like the ability to scroll right and left, and it's been credited as the first side-scrolling shooter. During its development, the designers decided that Asteroids really had something going for it with that wrapping right to left thing, but actually scrolling left and right was really forward thinking. 1980, it premiered at a trade show, not great response, but 1981, the game really takes off. It becomes one of the best-selling video games of all time. All buttons controlled, you controlled the movement with one hand. The asteroid style. And there's like a bunch of buttons, the different, uh, you know, firing mechanisms. I mean, so many different buttons, right? And here, here it is, what, 30 years later now? And you walk up to a Defender machine, and you were, it's just like riding a bike. You remember exactly all the buttons. Here's reverse, here's hyperspace, here's thrust, here's fire. I mean, it's all right there and it's like, it's like it never went away, right? It's not just about shooting the enemies and staying alive, but you have to rescue the humanoids as yes. well. Um, the game has a freaking mini map on the screen in 1981, which is huge. And the map shows where the enemies are. It, sh it shows you where the humans are. There's a lot going on. This is a really, really difficult game. Very hard, I think, to pick up and master in a quick time. It's not Pac-Man, right? It's not, it's not got the bright colors or anything to just draw you in and be like, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. No, this game will kick your ass. Like a lot of games back then, sure, but it'll kick your ass. So it was so popular that what um, Eugene Jarvis did was he went and he started a uh, basically a third party development house called VidKids. And their first game was Stargate, which was the sequel to Defender. It's a, it's a lot like Defender and it's pretty much the same gameplay. And it has nothing to do with Kurt Russell. And basically it was an instance of more of everything and better everything. Uh, Defender did not look bad by any means but for the time. The Stargate, but Stargate looked, looked even better. It looked incredible with the flashy lines of your, sh of your sh ship and the lasers you shot, it was like it was like trippy. You had to have mastered Defender, which is sort of its prequel, um, with you know five buttons and sticks and whatever, all these different controls. And they added more uh, enemy types in, um, and it was just a harder, better game. Uh, they sold that back to Williams, so he made money off of it while still working for Williams. And then he went on to make more pinball machines. I still suck at this game. I, I appreciate it for what it is, definitely. If it's in, uh, if it's in a, an arcade, I'll give it a whirl uh, for a couple quarters, and then I will respectfully disengage. That's actually a problem. That, that made the barrier to entry um, much higher. So you couldn't just walk up to Stargate and play it. You have bested me, Mr. Defender and or Stargate. I'm going off to play maybe some skee-ball or perhaps some Donkey Kong, because I feel more safe with that game on the inside. I it's eat or be eaten as you chase through mind-boggling mazes, gobbling up coins. Punch! Odyssey computer keyboard lets you program a myriad of mazes all your own. Nobody else's maze game does that. KC Munchkin, available now. Programmed by you. Atari thought to itself, you know, Let's not make a game that's sort of something like uh, Pac-Man. Let's make actual Pac-Man. 
So they go, they license, they license Pac-Man. So in 81, Magnavox on the good old Odyssey 2 releases a game called KC Munchkin. Magnavox does not do this with its Odyssey 2 system. Magnavox says, let's just straight up make a game that's like Pac-Man. This was about a year before Pac-Man came out for the Atari 2600. All I gotta say is Casey Munchkin again, Casey Munchkin. It's about eating stuff, dots, in a maze. Now, of course they would do this because everybody was doing this. Nobody was, you know, suing each other or anything. And while it's a good Pac-Man clone, it is a Pac-Man clone. Atari didn't like this, this game that was very similar to Pac-Man coming out on a home console before they had a chance to get their own, you know, original version out. So they sued him. A little further than a clone. In Casey Munchkin, you look like Pac-Man, except you're blue. You're, you're a pie. Far pie, your mouth moves up and down like Pac-Man does. sort of have ears. Sort of. Sort of. Today, we wouldn't really consider this much of a ripoff, and uh, and, and and really certainly probably nobody would, would end up suing over it in the in the environment that we have today. But there's ghosts in the game as well that are different They're colors. They're critters. And there's a maze. Sure, Casey Munchkin's a better version, but still, regardless, uh, it was deemed close enough. So the case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it was a landmark case because it was the first time there was any sort of decision made regarding video games and copyright. Atari actually won the lawsuit on appeal. Your video games were so new. This really established, this court case, the notion of copyright law uh, as far as it pertained to video games. Yeah, they had to pull it off the shelves. Could you imagine a game that ripped off another game's play style? Ironically, the sequel to the game, uh, Casey's Crazy Chase, uh, no longer has the, the ghost-like things that you would eat. It has yeah. a, a centipede. So it was kind of uh, up yours to Atari and their centipede. <laughs> it's a good thing we had the Casey Munchkin lawsuit to prevent such things. So there you go. So games like Casey Munchkin and Crazy Kong, you can't cut it. You gotta think up your own game, sorry. What happened to this law that we just have all sorts of crap, just boop -a -doo -a -doo -a -doo -a -doo -a And by boop -a -doo -a -doo -a -doo, I mean just copying the same ideas over and 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 over. So there you go. The legacy of Casey Munchkin and Casey's Crazy Chase. Uh, more software companies suing each other. 1981 was the year of Suing and Pac-Man colognes. That sums up the entire year. Thank you for watching 1981. Now, the other arcade games of 1981. Hey guys, I'm Pixel Dan, and these are the other arcade games of 1981. GORF! Or Galactic Orbiting Robot Force. That's what GORF means. Mousetrap. It's a lot like Pac-Man. Not so much like that board game. Lock and Chase. You're a thief collecting coins in a maze. And it's Data East's answer to Pac-Man. Are we seeing a trend here? And those are the other arcade games of 1981. Now, who's gonna let me borrow a quarter? I swore. Guess what my favorite early arcade game is? Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong was the first successful arcade game by Nintendo, but it certainly wasn't the first. In fact, Radar Scope came out uh, before Donkey Kong, and that was by Nintendo in the arcades. Nintendo's uh, first arcade machine, the, the submarine game, was a didn't do so well. actual total failure. Knowing that they needed to try something different, the company president Hiroshi Yamauchi had Shigeru Miyamoto design a game that they could convert those old unsold copies of Radar Scope into. Actually, I was hired to run the warehouse, and the biggest chore initially was to take all of the Radar Scope arcade games, we had 2,000 of them, big refrigerator sized boxes, and convert them all over to Donkey Kong. Most Donkey Kong arcades are light blue in color, but if, so every once in a while you come across one that might be a red in color, and that's just simply just an old Radar Scope cabinet that they retrofitted into a new Donkey Kong arcade machine. And those red cabinets are probably some of the rarest arcade cabinets you can get, actually. A lot of people will kind of wonder what Donkey Kong means, uh, what the meaning behind it. Now, the, the influence with Donkey Kong, Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, admitted that the big influence for Donkey Kong was uh, Beauty and Beast and Popeye. In fact, Nintendo was trying to go after the Popeye franchise and they couldn't, uh, so they decided to create their own characters. He was trying to come up with some sort of synonym for stubborn monkey, this stubborn monkey. And looking up English words, 
uh, he saw a donkey. That's kind of a synonym, because donkeys are stubborn, and made that direct translation a little strange, but sure, it's a donkey. It's a donkey monkey. You know, they just basically, Donkey Kong was gonna be like crazy ape. That's a stubborn monkey. You stubborn monkey. You're a Donkey Kong, aren't you? Now people look at Donkey Kong and say, you know, it's, it's a Mario game, but back then, the guy was just known as Jumpman. You know, he, didn't, he wasn't Mario. Mario wasn't even around then. Yeah. Uh, and you weren't saving Princess Peach in the game. You were saving his, uh, I guess it was his girlfriend, Pauline. Jumpman was renamed Mario, which we all love today. Mario was actually named Mario because it was the name of the Nintendo landlord at the time. Not only was his original name not Mario, he wasn't the fun-loving plumber that we know and love today. He was actually a carpenter, and Donkey Kong was his pet who he had mistreated, which is why Donkey Kong busted out of his cage and started kidnapping Pauline all the time. If I was a pet gorilla locked up too, I would get revenge on my owner by kidnapping his girlfriend. So I don't see what the big deal is, throwing down you know, barrels at, at Jumpman. Screw you, Jumpman. This is what you get. I'm gonna take your girl. He shouldn't have had a pet gorilla in the first place. One of the, I think, the biggest things that drew people in is it was the first game to technically have a story to it. It starts off with a, a beginning of the story and it, and it proceeds into the action and then there's actually an ending to the story. You know, that sort of, that sort of narrative structure, which is present in most video games today, again, did not exist before he introduced it with Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong was one of the very, 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 very first platforming games. Space Panic came out before that, but it actually introduced jumping to video games, something we do to this day. Jump. Oh, I thought you meant play video games. No, jump. Oh. Like, okay. If you climb up the ladder, the barrel's gonna come down the ladder. If you try to avoid it, then the barrel's just gonna travel, it's gonna drop down, it's gonna come over, it's gonna kill you. There's four separate screens in the arcade version of Donkey Kong. Now the one, cement factory, mud pies, whatever you want to call it, is emitted from almost every home port of the game, including all of Nintendo's official ports. But that's kind of unheard of for back then. A lot of times you saw maybe some slight maze changes or just a repeating uh, screen that got faster and harder. But no, there's distinct separate levels. You gotta kind of memorize the little quirks of the game. You know, there are certain ways you can just barely, you know, catch the edges of barrels and so forth, and you're just instantly dead. Donkey Kong is hard. It's really, really difficult. When I see like Weeby and Mitchell play Donkey Kong, I'm like, screw you, go to hell. How can you play that good? It's ridiculous. Construction or the conveyor belts in the uh, pies level. Yeah, uh, tough. That, that was probably the first time we all cursed out a conveyor belt. And, and, and that screws you because the first wave, you don't see that level. No. So when you get to it, you're like, what the hell is this? And you don't know what to do. So you gotta know exactly how to time those jumps, when to leave that hammer be, when to climb up the ladders, when to give up and go play Pac-Man. Shut up, shut up. I don't have the life for that. I wanna go take a bath. Well, I don't like to gloat, but uh... There was a uh, competition between Joey, Pat, and I at MAGFest, and Joey falsely claimed that he won, but uh, I have a, a picture photo proof of that I, I won the, uh, the, the competition. I was there. He's telling the truth. I did it. I got it done. There was a big lawsuit between Universal Studios and Nintendo. Doesn't Donkey Kong, didn't, what, didn't they rip off King Kong? Shouldn't we be suing them at this point? Uh, Universal Studios felt there was a copyright infringement with King Kong and the trademark they had there. Here we are, Universal Studios, we're huge. Here is this little company. It's not the Nintendo of today, it's this little company with a handful of employees. Um, we're gonna go in, we're gonna sue them, and they're gonna be so scared that they're gonna give us a piece of this Donkey Kong action is what's gonna happen. The, the stupidest part on Universal is this. Okay, so King Kong comes out in the 30s and then Universal wants to do a remake in 75, right? And RKO Pictures says, no, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And Universal successfully argues in 75, six years beforehand, that it is in the public domain. They find out that Universal did not actually own any copyrights to King Kong. Six years later, they have the balls to go and tell Nintendo what? that they own something that they don't. Long story short, uh, Nintendo won and also Universal found out they didn't own the rights to King Kong. 
Oopsie. And guess who won the case for Nintendo? A little lawyer by the name of Kirby. I wonder if Nintendo, you know, kind of paid tribute to that by making a game character out of him. Maybe, maybe. Arcade break. I always called it quicks. Some people call it kicks. Taito's Quicks, spelled just like Kick Cereal, except with a Q instead of a K, was an arcade game that was not nearly as popular as any of the games we've talked about so far, but it was a good game. Nothing is spelled out in Kicks, and other than the fact that you're told to fill a certain percent of the screen with color, you don't really know why you're doing this. You're making little boxes to capture the Kicks, Quicks, whatever it's called. Yeah. I'd like to know what the heck it is. It's just like this magical colorful thing yeah which is actually kind of cool look looking. cool it looked cool for the i mean for the graphics of the day you had this and that is floating thing i don't even know it, i don't even know how to describe it it's just magical it's magical it, it started its own genre which i guess was only kicks what super kicks and then any uh pornographic yeah, game yeah. in the 90s <laughs> with, yeah. with miss nude world 94 you know it, it, <laughs> where it, you had to fill up you know, you had to make squares to reveal a, a nude Asian woman. I was gonna say, <laughs> you know, a low quality JPEG of a nude Asian woman. It's been on so many platforms. It's another one of those games that, similar to it, or the game itself has appeared on everything at, at some point. Press start. So you think you're fast enough to beat the bomber? I don't think so. Not only was Kaboom Rue's catchphrase during E3 2012, it was also a popular Atari 2600 game. It was made by Larry Kaplan, and it uses the paddle controllers. Kaboom was a gigantic title for the Atari VCS, and it was significant because it began to show that Activision was putting out some of the best games on the system. Mm. Basically, in it, you play as three buckets. You are not a human, you are three buckets. The goal of the game was to catch bombs in a plastic bucket that were being dropped by this mad bomber. Because apparently buckets can withstand an explosion. The whole time he's dropping bombs, he's got this angry face. This was uh, terrorism <laughs> at its finest here. And then if you miss one and it blows up, he smiles. You're getting kids ready for the, 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 the 2000 period. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty twisted for a mainstream Atari 2600 game. It's a really fast paced game. Um, it really scratches that itch for, uh, you know, one more time score attack kind of gameplay. It used the paddle controller, which was awesome. I still love the paddle controller to this day. It's still popular to the States. Had re-releases on multiple platforms, but without an actual paddle, it doesn't play anything like it should. Kaboom! And now, the freaking awesome computer games of 1981. Greetings, and welcome to Clint's Freaking Awesome Computer Games, because if they weren't awesome, I wouldn't give a crap. Now, in 1981, we have a lot of Apple II games, starting with Muse Software's Castle Wolfenstein, an early stealth action game where you go around killing Nazis and looting their bodies. You also have The Demon's Forge by Brian Fargo, a graphical text adventure game that has very little to nothing at all to do with forging demons. And lastly, we have Online Systems Soft Porn Adventure, a text adventure game that is far less awesome than it sounds. You just go around and try to get laid with text. And that's it for my freaking awesome computer games of 1981. And there's always plenty of games every year, but it's nice to know where to start. Arcade break. Venture. Um, kind of like Berserk. It's, Venture is, Another one of those gen generic maze games that kind of wanted to go with a fantasy theme to uh, kind of go with the success of adventure. And you would have this 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 maze that had usually I believe four corners, and each corner was its own separate, not really maze, but kind of like almost like a dungeon where they had different different obstacles. Uh, adventure was pretty popular at the time and was ported over to a lot of the systems. Coleco got a good part of it. Some Atari 2600. But that game used to scare the hell out of me when I was a kid. Like it always made me tense because I, it was like it was like a scary game. Like the music made it like a very atmospheric and very intense. The thing I find most interesting about it, frankly, is that the high score on it hasn't changed for like 30 years. I don't know if it's because no one's playing this game or if it's that hard or what, but it's like the. the the high score was found was done by a kid in Canada in 1982, and no one else has bested it since. Um, 
good on him. So 81 was really the first year we had a video game console war between Atari and Intellivision. Boy, they were going after each other. They were just, they mm, cutthroat after each other. Ads, attack ads, it was like a political campaign. Sunday, 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 <laughs> it's the Atari and Television War. You're brown and black, I'm brown and gold. <laughs> Go <f> yourself. <laughs> now 80 was a breakout year for Atari due to Space Invaders selling a bazillion copies and Intellivision was trying to get their foot in the door still. Ah! So what was a good way to do it? Why not compare on TV your technologically superior system to the system that was already three, four years old. And they start warring it out on television with, with incredibly entertaining advertisements. With George Plimpton. I'll try almost anything. So when Mattel Electronics asked me to compare their Intellivision games with Atari, I gave it a try. Sure it was no Sega does what Nintendo don't, but it had George Plimpton in that I didn't know kid. Excuse me. Have you compared them to Intellivision? Intellivision? Sure, they've got great space games, like Intellivision Space Battle. I didn't know. Who better to compare video game systems than George Plimpton, a middle-aged uh, <laughs> middle-aged writer and poet? He seemed trustworthy. Uh, and he just kind of came across as like, you know, the Intellivision system is so much better than the Atari, you know? And graphically, it, it was. So he had written books about what it was like to really train and be with this game. So he was the big sports expert of the common person playing sports. He wanted to pose a question to the audience, basically. He would come out and say, hi, I'm George Plimpton, and look at, here's Atari baseball. You know? and here's a television baseball, and people are running around bases. The ball moving, and the characters were actually, that, mo that famous in television motion, like all the characters were moving, the, the smooth animation. It actually looked like a baseball game. Yeah. And, and so the guy, the dad at home, he, say, he looks at the attorney and goes, I don't see a baseball diamond. But he looks at ours and says, hey, it's a baseball diamond. I'd always heard a lot of stories about people like, I was able to convince my parents to get us a video game system because I was able to convince them to get an Intellivision because my dad wanted to play the baseball game. The sports games for Intellivision were obviously better than the sports games yeah. at the time for the VCS. You didn't have one, you'd be like, you know what, that Atari baseball game with only four guys in the field, yeah, yeah. I think I do want the one that actually has right. all nine. The very first time that voice was ever used in a video game was MLB Baseball for the Intellivision, the great, you're out. That's what launched in television with the sports games. That was it. And so they tried, Atari tried to come back and say, yeah, they got great sports games, but they don't have space games. So, you know, in television, like every time they came out the commercial, in television was right there with a, and now here's Space Armada and here's Astro Smash. In television, space games from the Teleelectronics. Once you compare, you'll know. Comparing directly Star Strike to the Asteroid, which is the big seller on the 2600, basically saying, here's Star Strike, with, you know, basically some sort of 3D-ish graphics, and Asteroids looks like trash. That was basically what George Plimpton was saying in a very nice way, in his nice gray, uh, gray suits. And the worst was is when he was done. Oh my God. It was, see, that wasn't so hard. I think my favorite's gotta be the really awkward one with a little kid that like wheels up next to George Plimpton getting out of his car. He's on his little bicycle and he's just like so in awe. He's like, Mr. Television? Well, your friends aren't gonna have this newest one. It's Frog Bog. Oh man, they're not gonna believe this. Can I get your autograph? Certainly. What's your name? My name? And I talked to George Plimpton uh, years ago before he died, and he, he said, you know, they actually came in and they gave him an Atari, they gave him an Intellivision, and he had to fill out affidavits for the FCC, F, uh, FTC, um, that he did find Intellivision better. He said, of course they were paying me, so I had an incentive to find it better, but I really didn't find it better. The, the graphics actually looked a lot better. Now, by today's standards, they still look like blocky crap. <laughs> but back then, you were like, Hell yeah, that, that looks like an actual player. That looks like an actual man running with the soccer ball. That looks like an actual guy batting the ball. Even today, you know, some people are still, it's very strange, some people today are still 
oh, in television versus Atari. Oh, Atari was better. Oh, this was better. And they're still fighting about this. Atari did win the console war eventually, though, but that's because they had just some really blockbuster hits with Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and things like that. But Intellivision did give them quite a run for its money. It's kind of ironic that the Intellivision commercials featured E.T.'s Henry Thomas, and the infamous E.T. game was released on the Atari 2600, not the Intellivision and that the E.T. game led to the demise of the Atari 2600. It's out of this world. And now, the Forgotten Video Games of 1981. Pat here bringing you the Forgotten Video Games of 1981. Make Tracks, a maze game by Williams where you try to paint while being harassed by fish. Yeah, that sounds normal. Battle of Atlantis, Comsoft's goofy yet challenging submarine shooter. Omega Race, Midway's bouncy asteroids clone that put your score and life information in the middle of the screen? And Bosconian, Namco's free-roaming space shooter, which was the first game to offer continues. Pump those quarters in! And those were the forgotten video games of 1981. Just because you don't remember them doesn't mean they weren't fun. Bonus game. Ultima and Wizardry. I don't give a damn about Ultima, so I'll let Rue or someone else cover that one. But I can talk about Wizardry. Oh yes, I can talk about Wizardry. Ultima. This, many people uh, see as one of the most important role-playing games developed. It, it was it was actually an offshoot, or, or it was um, it's kind of a reimagining, an expansion, what, what have you, of uh, a Calabeth. Both were created by Richard Garriott, uh, who is a young, uh, promising uh, hobbyist programmer at the time. And uh, actually he developed a Calabeth in high school. He developed Ultima uh, during his freshman year in college. It was an overhead uh, RPG, simple graphics. It took a lot of the gameplay of a Calabeth and just kind of tweaked it, make it made it more. It added quests. It added uh, an overworld with the tile set graphics, which were impressive, very impressive for the day. And you try to get to space somehow. For some reason, you end up in a space shuttle. It's a wacky game. There were some strange things though. Um, it, was, it was kind of like, it ran the whole fantasy gamut. You know, from old wizards and warriors up into sci-fi. Uh, you could buy a spaceship Space Shuttle specifically, I believe. And there was like shooter, space shooter aspects in this RPG. Like Dungeons and Dragons wasn't bad enough preventing countless of tens of thousands of teenage boys from getting laid. This crap was dropped in their laps. Wizardry was made in 1981 by Andrew Greenberg and Robert Woodhead, published by Sir Tech Games. And this is kind of the genesis of everything I love in RPGs. Uh, it's a first person dungeon crawling game. And what was big about it for the time is that it's uh, there's a lot of graphic in it. The maze is rendered very, very simply, but the uh, enemies are rendered in color for the most part, as long as you're playing on an Apple II with a color monitor. It was also the first PC role-playing game to use a true party-based system for your dungeon crawling experiences. So you would have not only one person to take care of, you had a whole group of people with different stats and abilities. I think you can have up to six people in your party. You could choose their class, you could choose their alignment, you could choose, uh, it was very much, both obviously are based off of D&D elements, but Wizardry was very much more of an almost straight D&D. You take the tabletop pen and paper and you put it in a computer program. This is what you get, Wizardry. There's also a lot of puzzles in these games. Uh, weird warp zones set up in, map, in, in the dungeons. Keep in mind, you don't have a map. You have to make your own map. Grab the graphing paper. You're not getting out of this unless you make your own map. Back in my day, we right. had manuals and maps. So, so, you know, you hit a warp zone and you don't know where you are, and half the fun is figuring out how all these pieces, spinners, warp zones, etc., interact on a floor, sometimes between floors, to get you to your final goal. And it really just jump-started the Japanese RPG market through Dragon Quest, later Final Fantasy, and of course, all the rest, all the tons and tons of Japanese RPGs that came out later, they all kind of draw their lineage to Ultima and Wizardry. Arcade Break. 
Vroom! It, it's turbo. So in 1981, graphics weren't very advanced, but this was, you know, this was colorful, varying environments. The car could move not only left and right, but forwards and backwards yeah. on the screen on the road. But you would have to pass a certain amount of cars in a certain amount of time. So, it, you know, it, it made the game that much more challenging. The interesting thing about the development of Turbo was that the programmer was actually hospitalized from exhaustion and a spontaneously collapsed lung. Now that is dedication. Most games were still one static screen and one overhead, usually an overhead perspective, and that was it. And here, here comes this game that's throwing 3D sprite scaling at you in 81. Who, who's the company that, that made that? Oh yeah, that, that, this, this is Sega. Sega. Se Sega they were cornering, it seemingly, the driving racing game market. And in the early 80s, that's not hard to do because there's not much you can do with it. It's either turbo or sprint. That was your choices, really, in 81. Yeah. Right, start. 1981 brought on the masterful, incredibly interesting tabletop units. Made by Coleco. Tabletop games, baby. They look just like arcade games. You had the side art on them. You had the marquee. Donkey Kong and Midway's Pac-Man and Galactic. The arcade games you can take home with you from Coleco. Some of the original Pac-Man artwork on this one, like Pac-Man with feet. Yeah, I never understood this. I mean, it's it kind of looks more like a ghost than an actual Pac-Man, and he looks kind of like perverted. He looks like a cracked out, like, you know, testicle with legs and red eyes. It's kind of messed up. You had the control panel with the joysticks. These were really cool because Oh, you can play little handhelds and like a little game in a watch, or you can play something looks like a freaking arcade machine right in your home. And you know what? For the most part, they were decent games. It was basically like the power of the arcade in the palm of your hand, except it didn't quite fit in the palm of your hand. And it wasn't really the power of the arcade. So, yeah. Well, the Donkey Kong one even has two levels represented in it, which is crazy. Most of them, most of them would only have one, but that one's got the uh, the jump the barrels and the girders uh, worked into it. So you had Coleco getting on the, on the action, licensing the Nintendo stuff. Nintendo Game and Watch tabletops, they had those. You had um, let's see, Antex came out with with their versions. I think they did uh, they did Defender, I believe. Um, so you had all of these companies getting in on the action with these guys. I wanted one so bad, my parents were like, no. <laughs> you know, you had a lot of handheld LCD handhelds that were cool. I mean, this was before we had a lot of, uh, you know, interchangeable cartridge, handheld portable gaming devices or anything like that. So LCD handhelds, yeah, that makes sense. But to have something that's so stationary and kind of big and bulky, I never really understood the appeal. And I love these things because they tend to use VFD displays, vacuum fluorescent displays, which um, have all of the limitations of an LCD display, but it uses fluorescent light to create a very bright, colorful picture on the screen. So they look nice and they're fun to play, um, and they're appealing just from a design standpoint. By no means are these perfect, but they're excellent for what they are. It wasn't anything I really wanted. I would rather have something that was handheld that could take with me in the car. Uh, didn't, you know, take 15 gigawatts of electricity to run. And it takes four C batteries. Four very old, ever ready C batteries. <laughs> Apparently not ready because this unit is not working. This one is off. These are ever not ready. The only thing I didn't like about these, back then these were expensive. They're still expensive. The only kids I knew that had these were the freaking rich kids that lived across town that had like five of these. And I couldn't get one of them. Yeah, but I got them now. I always hated that one kid in school who just like, just got everything. Just every little freaking everything that came out. Oh, uh, look at me. I caught any yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I got the Super yeah. Nintendo. Oh, I got the Nintendo 64. And now they're, they're highly, highly collectible and highly, highly valuable. Um, they're, they're not that cheap to, to, to acquire these days. Yeah. I got a 3DO. Mmm. I freaking hated those kids. I know. School. I remember I went to his like, house. Oh, how the hell did you get a $600 because I'm rich and white? Eh, people bought them, I guess. Mostly collectors buy them now because. Eh. 
Here are the popular pinball games of 1981. Hey everyone, Ian here with the popular pinball games of 1981. Fathom by Bally. Not only are you rescuing scuba divers amongst the crazy underwater backdrop, but you've got two crossover return lanes which let you save the ball in a number of different ways. Barracora by Williams. Backlass inspired by H.R. Geiger. Attractive fish women on the playfield. And the pinball isn't so bad either. And a personal favorite, Centaur by Bally. A great rule set, a stunning black and white playfield. And that Centaur in the title? Half orc, half motorcycle. There is no table, more metal. And those were the popular pinball machines in 1981, because there's more to life than just video games. Yards of Venge was my first project at Atari. It was a place I really wanted to be, and it was very important to me to make a contribution, to make a real splash with it. Yards of Venge started as a port of Star Castle. Uh, and you can kind of see that in how the game plays. But it occurred to me that I could just take some of the components, some of the elements of that game, and reformulate them into something that would fit the 2600 and suit that well. The goal is to um, chip away the, the, the shield around the co-tile and send a missile <clears throat> into, the, uh, in, into the shield and, and, and destroy the co-tile. I realized that if you take game functions that are buttons or stick moves and work them into game play instead so that you earn a function instead of just pushing a button for a function it enhances the game play when you eat away at the shield it puts a missile behind you and you can move the missile up and down as you move the ER. so by simplifying the controller scheme i made it a more usable game and forced myself to enhance the design in a way that I think really improved the playability of the game. Does anyone else find Yars Revenge a very trippy game? Like, something about that droning sound in the background and the stuff flying at you. When I was playing Yars Revenge when I was a kid, this is what I envisioned for sure. Were you eating acid? You're eating the wall, and you're a fly. Man, it's some weird stuff. What was uh, Yar getting revenge? On. Was, what, what, did the aliens kill his wife and kids? Like, well, why was it Yar's Revenge? I don't feel like the backstory was really fleshed out that well. They actually have a full-fledged story going on here, which covers a couple pages. And then I wrote a story. I think I was one of the first people to actually write a backstory for a game. The game was about Yar of the Rossic solar system. So the joke was, it was basically Ray Kassar, the CEO of Atari. It was his name spelled backwards. The interesting thing was that Ray had no idea about this. Ray knew nothing about this, but I just figured no one in marketing is going to have the balls to talk to Ray about it. It's a unique game and a simple game, and because of that, it's one of those ones that I can easily waste 45 minutes on. And ironically, it's known to be one of the best Atari 2600 games developed by Howard Scott Warshaw, who developed E.T. I, I really like it when people say E.T. is the worst game ever made, because people consistently talk about Yar's Revenge as one of the best games that was ever made. So I figure that gives me the greatest range of any game designer in history. Next level. One of the reasons that Pac-Man was so popular because it appealed to both uh, males and females. So Miss Pac-Man took that formula and are, all right, girls are playing this game. Now girls are really going to want to play this because we have our first iconic, you know, female video game character. You know, I think the single takeaway from Miss Pac-Man is how little difference there is between male and female. I mean, really, all you need is a red bow separate the two genders automatically. I mean, there you go. I am now female. I feel so liberated. Yeah, Miss Pac-Man was essentially almost like a homebrew. Yeah, like a hack. It was a hack. Miss Pac-Man was originally designed by programmers at General Computer Corporation as an enhancement kit for Pac-Man, and they called it Crazy Auto. And then Midway, who had the rights to Pac-Man in America, uh, found out about these guys and said, hey, that looks cool. How about you just make that game for us and we'll pay you for that? And they said, sure, let's do that. And that became Ms. Pac-Man. They really should have called it Pac-Man. It's way more catchier and politer. Er. Ms. Pac-Man, in my opinion, is better than Pac-Man. My opinion too. Ms. Pac-Man is special because it really takes the formula of Pac-Man and improves upon it in almost every way you could hope to see. Different maze combinations. Different mazes. Bouncing fruit. It changes up the AI of the ghosts so that you cannot follow the same patterns that you followed in, in regular Pac-Man. Faster speed. 
Uh, yes, it was a bit faster. They, they tweaked the speed, the AI, the maze layout, and gave you something that was incredibly familiar and incredibly fresh at the same time.